to Jocelyn Wright, who is a PhD candidate at the University of Texas at Austin. Her research focuses on contemporary cultural productions by the French Bayeux. Her dissertation, tentatively titled Beurre Blanc Black, Bayeux Narratives Speaking Back in Literature, Film and Graphic Novels, 1999. 2015, examines responses to Islamophobia, as well as media characterizations of the Bonio by young writers, artists, musicians, and filmmakers, indeed from 1999 to 2015. Thank you so much, Matthew, for that introduction and everyone for being here on a Saturday morning. Um, my talk, as you see, will be titled Polyphonic Disintegration, Muslims in French Bonne Culture. What does it mean to be Muslim and French in contemporary France? In the past 20 years, a number of events, both inside and outside France, have complicated this dual identity by creating a negative perception of Islam and reinforcing the narrative of Islam's incompatibility with the Western identity. The Algerian War in the 1990s once again equated Algeria with violence in the French cultural memory, and this was further exacerbated by the Kalakikal terrorist bombings in Paris in 1995. In the early 2000s, the publication of several témoignages by young Maghrebi women pointed to the violence they suffered at the hands of men in the Bombia, areas outside of major city centers where recent immigrants and minorities tend to live, in the name of radical Islam, from arranged marriages to gang rapes. The debates of the Stasi Commission surrounding the passage of a law banning religious symbols in school, which was effectively a ban on the Muslim headscarf in public schools, further kept the focus on radical Islam in the bon Mieux. Outside of France, the September 11 terrorist attacks in the United States and the resulting war on terror fueled a continuing conversation in the media about the dangers of radical Islam in particular, the compatibility of Islam and the West, and the ability of Muslims to integrate or become a part of French society. In light of these events, this paper considers the extent to which French Muslim characters in novels <coughs> set in the Balmia foreground or hide their Muslim identity. The first major group of such novels emerged in the 1980s with the Beur novel, novels written by Beurs, which is to say second and third generation Maghrebi immigrants to France, which sought to answer questions of identity and belonging. Alec Hargreave has described these novels as a kind of Bildungsroman, which engage with a split between, quote, two different parts of the self, one which identifies with the secular values of contemporary France, and one which, through the family home, remains engaged with the Islamic traditions of North Africa." End quote. Novels exemplify, exemplary of this tradition include Azuz Begag's 1986 novel, Le Gond de Charba, Mehdi Shahaf's 1983 novel, Le Théo Arham d'Archi Ahmed, or Farida Belgoul's 1986 novel, Georgette. As the Beurre label caught on, however, it became, in Catherine Clevenger's words, a kind of brand which simultaneously made their novels more visible, while also preventing authors labeled as such from having their work read neutrally, which led to the need to begin to reject this label. Indeed, by the 1990s, authors such as Soha Yemini were visibly resisting the label with titles such as Ils disent que je suis une Beurat, they say that I am a Beurat, um, which only included Beur in the title due to the insistence of her editor who did not publish it. If she didn't put, the title, put that in the title. From the mid-1990s forward, I argue that an updated form of writing about identity has emerged in the form of the polyphonic Bolmia novel, which affirms a global polyphonic identity based in a shared experience of economic inequality that is neither race nor religion specific, even when it is written by French Muslims or contains French Muslim characters. These texts, of which Rashid Jaidani's 1999 novel Bunka was one of the first, were often still written by Beurs, but are nonetheless oops, um, but are nonetheless different in that they were less concerned with the specificity of the Muslim Maghrebi experience in France. Instead, these Balmya novels focus more on a collective Balmya experience, 
which became a stand-in for the universal experience of marginalization in economically disadvantaged spaces around the world. I will first define the polyphonic Bolmio novel before moving to a case study of how Muslim identity is represented and manipulated in Yasiel Ben Malou's 2003 novel, Allah Superstar. In 2007, several authors of this new form of writing, um, Tarid Amalal, Habiba Mahani, Mabruk Rashidi, Faiz Again, Khalid al Bahji, Jean Henri Boulin, Demu Kuman, Mohamed Razan, Seneh Ouazen, and Tom Terrain, collaborated to write a manifesto, Qui fait la France, who makes up France, which defined the Balmier novel as a socially engaged project that transcended race, building a community that was instead founded on the shared experiences of marginalized populations. While many of the signatories were though, several were not, again emphasizing the relevance and necessity of a hybrid identity that is based around more than the identity politics of a single marginalized culture or religion. Emphasizing their mixed identities, these authors joined forces dans la bataille, la, excuse me, dans la bataille pour l'égalité des droits et le respect de tout au-delà des origines géographiques et des conditions sociales, affirming a desire to, quote, procéder les frontières et aussi récupérer les espaces confisqués qui nous reviennent de droit pour l'aspiration légitime à l'universalisme. The collective goal of the Balmier novel, then, can be seen as one that transcends the specificity of an individual culture or religion to build an international community based on a shared experience of social conditions such as marginalization and lack of economic opportunity. If we look at the way that Muslim identity is presented in Balmia novels from 1999 to present, we see two main approaches. Either it is hidden from the reader for the bulk, if not all, of the text, as is the case with Jayadani's protagonist Yaz in Bunko, or the new in Ahmed Judah's 2006 novel, Desintegration, or it is emphasized early on, as is the case in Faisal Yen's 2004 novel, Kif Kif Demain, or Yassir Ben Malou's 2003 novel, Allah Superstar. Nevertheless, even when Muslim or Maghrebi identity is placed at the center of a text, it is done in a novel in, that is written in a style that foregrounds a global identity that is based around a character's a shared experience of poverty, and that reaches outwards, beyond the borders of France. The character's individual identity, then, is only one part of a larger identity, exactly the kind of integration that French policies claim to strive for, except that this larger identity is not an exclusively French identity, but rather a global identity that extends across Europe and to references that reach Africa and the United States as well. These authors accomplish this through the style of polyphony. I define polyphony, as it appears in the Balmier novel, as the presence of multiple elements, genres, languages, points of view, historical events, bodies, and cultures, all of which are given equal weight within the work of art that precludes a finalizing discourse. My definition builds on Michael Bakhtin's original definition of polyphony, which he viewed as a plurality of, quote, independent and unmerged voices and consciousnesses with equal rights and each with its own world, end quote while expanding the possibility for these voices and consciousnesses beyond the thoughts or feelings of specific characters to an understanding which allows for these voices to be different languages, different genres, or different cultural references. Polyphony, which was a musical term before Bakhtin co-opted it, refers to the simultaneous presence of multiple melodies within a single song. I build on this concept of the harmonious combination of multiple melodies to see polyphony as a plurality of genres and voices, some literal differentiated languages, existing within a single work. The element of harmony is key here. This combination of genres does not create dissonances, but rather a rich symphony created by the successful unification of these seemingly different elements. Like Gilles Deleuze and Félix Guattari's rhizomes, these differentiated chords create a non-hierarchical web of significations that can disconnect and reconnect, folding into one another and creating new meaning process. Variations on polyphony have long been applied to Francophone North African literature, a recognized precursor to and influence on both the Beur and Balmier literature. Indeed, polyphony, through the inclusion of reference and allusions to multiple cultures, countries, genres, languages, and literary canons, was a common aspect of many Francophone North African novels, 
to how Benjamin Saruda, Asya Jabal's La Soif, and Kateb Yassim's Nejma, among many others. The polyphonic Francophone North African novel has also been linked to the creation of a new nation. For an example, we need look no further than Yassim's Nejma, whose eponymous protagonist is often interpreted as a symbol of a new post-colonial Algerian nation. Authors of the polyphonic Bonnier novel likewise employ polyphony, albeit of a different, less stylized, high-modernist variety, to accomplish the same goals that embraces and encourages multiple cultural perspectives and references. They adapt the polyphonic strategies of authors that McGrubby, of the McGrubby authors who came before them to represent their experience in the bon Dieu. The, poly the polyphonic bon Dieu novel is thus an updated method of textual resistance against a hegemonic characterization of the post-colonial bon Dieu subject. The authors of the polyphonic bon Dieu novel created a massive community where differences and multiplicities of identities are seen as a strength with a shared experience of economic inequality being the glue that binds these disparate communities together. Yassir Bindalud's 2003 polyphonic Bolnia novel, A La Superstar, employs his polyphonic writing style to engage with these questions of what it means to be Muslim in contemporary France. The novel tells the story of a 19-year-old beau, Kamel Léon, who aspires to stardom, his pathway out of the lower class, and away from the label Jeanne d'Origine Difficile, through comedy. The novel recounts how Kemel Lyon exploits a Muslim identity in order to gain fame and recognition, as it is the only way for him to escape being doomed to a life of flipping hamburgers she quick. Kemel Lyon is transparent about the economic inequalities and racism that lead him down this path. He explains how, quote, unlike a Francais normal, Si tu prends un jeune d'origine difficile issu d'un quartier sensible d'éducation prioritaire en zone de non-droit, donc un arabe ou un noir, eh bien lui, il n'a pas le choix. Soit il est star, soit il est rien. To be rien, or nothing, as an Arab or black person in France, is not to be anonymous, but rather to be dead. In the wake of the September 11th terrorist attacks in the US, Kevin Leon sees an opportunity noting that this event and the subsequent war on terror opened up a door for Muslim comedians who became successful in a voyeuristic culture that sought to better understand the motivation behind these terrorists um, acting in the name of radical Islam. Ben Mahmoud's polyphonic writing style blends a rich web of references to the cultural capital to be found both within and outside of the Balmya through references to a variety of television programs, films, music, novels, brands, and advertisements that draw from high and low culture, not just in France, but also in Africa, Europe, and the Americas. A self-described étranger, a play on Albo Camus' L'étranger, Camélion exploits his position as both within and outside Maghrebi and French culture. The son of an Algerian man and a French woman, which resulted in his name that is equal parts Arab and French, the protagonist of Allah's superstar can blend into either culture. His ability to change his identity in order to blend in with the times is underscored by the combined name itself, Camel Leon, which evokes an Camelion, a chameleon, which is, by Camel's own account, quote, an animal qui prend la couleur de l'époque, since the couleur of Camel's époque is Islamophobia in the post-9-11 era, he capitalizes on this. Kamel's chameleon-esque nature is best seen through his manipulation of his beard. While he himself doesn't have a beard, he adopts a fake one in order to play the stereotypical Arab. This play on his identity becomes material in the form of a bus advertisement where each side of the bus features a picture of Kamel, one without the beard, with the caption, Cet homme est un terroriste, this man is a terrorist, and the other, which reads, Ce terroriste est un homme, this, man, this terrorist is a man. Here we see how Kamel plays up his identity, playing into the expectations of what he is supposed to be in order to gain notoriety and avoid sinking into oblivion, which to him, as a jeune d'origine difficile, is akin to death. Leaning into the societal expectations that surround his identity, Kamel makes it his goal to get a fatwa, as he concludes that it is the fastest way to gain international recognition. Since this particular quote is rather long and I dissect it for some time, I will skip over actually reading it. Um, but if you look here, we see Kamel's willingness to acquire fame at tout prix 
pushed to an extreme. He will happily risk death threats in order to gain an audience. At the same time, in concluding that a fatwa is the only way in order to gain the type of recognition he desires, Kamal is drawing attention to the hypocrisy of a community that is so prejudiced against Muslims and Islam that they only become interested in performers who are actively rejected by, or choose on their own to reject, the Muslim community. Indeed, Kamel's imagined scenario of what would happen if a fatwa were issued against him closely parallels what actually happened to writer Salman Rushdie in the 1980s. His books did indeed fly off the shelves, and he even found himself on stage with you too, following the issuance of a fatwa against him by Iranian Ayatollah Khomeini. Just as was the case with Rushdie, Kamel's presumption about the monetary gains from a fatwa turns out to be accurate, as once a fatwa is issued against Kamel, his comedy career and visibility does indeed explode. Kamel, however, is not satisfied simply with recognition within France. As we see in the above quoted passage, his cultural references look outward, beyond France. Startup for Kamel is not simply beers with Chirac, a metonym for recognition in France, but also an acknowledgement by the Pope, a stand-in for the Christian community, Russian and American leaders, the Middle East, and internationally renowned cultural phenomena like the rock band U2. Kamel's gaze beyond France is indicative of a larger phenomenon in the polyphonic Balmia novel, in which the conversation extends from the periphery beyond the French metropole. This stands in sharp contrast with the Berg novels that preceded the Balmia novel, which were typically concerned with characters' relationships between um, Algeria and metropolitan France, or between the periphery of France, the Balmia, and its center, the metropole. With its mosaic cultural touchstones, the protagonists of the polyphonic Bolnia novel seek to create an international community devoid of binary references and individual religious or racial identities. Indeed, Kemmel rejects the concept of roots entirely as a method of conceptualizing his identity. Say, moi ce qui m'intéresse c'est pas les racines, c'est les branches. L'important c'est pas d'où tu viens, mais où tu vas. This Toulousian concept of branches is a flexible way of conceiving selfhood, which is not rooted in one's origins, but rather allows one to take control of one's identity through the branches that one creates outward, beyond a, spe beyond a specific identity, to create an identity beyond one's ethnic or religious origins. Indeed, Kamel's branche extend far beyond a binary of France and Algeria, or the center versus the periphery of France, towards a desire for a global recognition of his identity. Despite his many references to French culture, there is also an insistence on the part of Camel that French culture in isolation is hopelessly antiquated. This is best shown through his fumbling, alcoholic French agent, Claude Martin, who is so behind the times that he still tries to pay his bar tab with francs instead of euros. Martin's general, or Martin's general incompetence is contrasted with the success of international French superstars, such as singers like Nodouin or Alsenk, who are assigned with the aptly named label Universal. Pigeonholed by his outdated French manager, Camel must, find, uh, Camel must find other ways to gain global recognition by exploiting a caricature, caricature of the Muslim man. Nevertheless, this caricature of a Muslim man is equally limiting for Camel Leon, as the more he leans into this Muslim identity, the more it becomes the only thing that he is understood for. Like many Beaux before him, Camel Leon blames the press, who ask him questions that have nothing to do with him as an individual because, quote, La France jamais elle s'intéresse à toi en tant que toi quand tu es un rebeu. Instead, they want a very specific type of information, asking questions like, Qu'est-ce que tu as à nous vendre aujourd'hui? De la banlieue, de la tournante, de l'islam, des armes, du shit, de la première guerre d'Algérie, de la deuxième guerre d'Algérie. When he refuses to play their game and instead talk about the search for gainful employment in a period of economic inequality, they chide him. C'est trop violent comme sujet. On a des mouflettes à cette heure-là. It's too violent a subject. Children are watching. Through this exchange, we see a virulent critique of a press that is only interested in narratives that feed into and re-express the specific sound bites and talking points they wish to discuss. Should one attempt to get at the problem lying under the surface, a gross economic inequality, 
This is seen as far more dangerous than all of the actually violent subjects the press freely discusses, such as drugs, rape, or war. Ultimately, Camelion's journey to stardom leads him to become a suicide bomber at his own show being performed on the 11th of September. In other words, he becomes the very stereotype or character he thought he was only successfully manipulating in order to gain fame. There are several ways of reading this ending, which is left rather deliberately ambiguous. Kennel does indeed kill himself and over 200 other people at, the clo at his closing show at L'Olympia, but the reader is left to speculate as to why. One way this can be read is the danger of foregrounding one's Muslim identity so aggressively in contemporary France. It is inevitable that, should one do so, one will quite literally be overtaken by this identity and die. I would argue, though, that the clues in the book are meant to draw the reader to a different conclusion. The very same spectator culture Camelion semi-successfully exploited is steeped in a voyeurism that we, as readers and analysts of this culture, must beware. Nobody took interest in Camelion as a comedian until he got his fatwa and changed his act to exploit his Muslim identity for commercial gain. And even as he became famous, the interest of the press, and indeed even of this paper I am reading to you, is what Camelion is saying about the Muslim community or the conditions of Muslim in France, or in the bon vieux. Camillion's story asks the question, is it possible to be Muslim and to talk about one's Muslim identity without it turning into some sort of voyeuristic société du spectacle, and simultaneously chastising the reader who tries to turn it into just that? If the other works by and about Muslims in France emerging during this period are any indication, there is an increasing refusal of the exact Société du Spectacle that Camélion exploited for his own personal fame and gain. Instead, there is the upholding of a polyphonic model, blending references to multiple cultures, languages, and religions, of which an author or character's Muslimness is a part, but not the defining whole, of their identity. Thus, we see the creation of a globalized identity that is inclusive of all persons in the space of the bon vieux, brought together by language and a shared experience of economic inequality, and gestures, and is in dialogue with communities outside of France, suggesting that the conversation has moved from one of an individual speaking for a group, or the periphery speaking to the center, to one in which the periphery looks out beyond the metropolis border, marginalized communities around the world.